Good day, everyone. We will continue our topic or a discussion or a lecture with regulatory framework with our second topic, which is General Banking Law of 2000 or Republic Act 8791. All right. This particular law, Republic Act 8791, or the General Banking Law of 2000, was enacted and promulgated by Congress because of the state's recognition of uh, the importance of the vital role of banks in providing an environment conducive to the sustained development of our national economy. And of course, the recognition of the state of the fiduciary nature of banking that requires high standards of integrity and performance. Now, if you say fiduciary nature class, it means that the banking industry primarily rests in the trust and confidence of the public, that the banking industry is imbued with public interest. It's because the industry itself, the banks operate it upon the continuous trust and confidence of its depositors, its clientele. The, um, this trust and confidence is significant. It's because banks generate funds from accepting are getting OPM or other, other people's money. And it's because the public is parting ways of their hard-earned cash to banks in exchange for minimum interest rates. It's because people are looking for safe places to, to safe keep their extra cash. And at the same time, while these cash is being safe kept by banking institutions, um, they also generate minimum income. It grows at the same time, but not that much, but it grows. In exchange for this, banks will generate, will create a fund, and this fund now allows the bank to lend to um, businesses, invest in higher yield ventures, and the difference now between the income made by the bank out of this particular fund and the interest um, expense and the perspective of the bank, which is the interest income of the depositor, is basically the income of the bank. The bank makes money out of the difference of their in investment income and the interest charges that it, it pays to its depositors. Because remember, in, in banking, the creditor here class are the depositors and the borrower is the bank. It's basically another scheme of telling of, 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 of the banks borrowing money from the public in order for it to generate funds that it may make available as credit now to uh, other individuals who might need it for their businesses or institutions or companies or corporations that require debt financing. And because of these um, uh, public interest, because the public are the depositors, and small mistake in the banking industry that would diminish the trust and confidence of the public it will destroy now the fiduciary nature of the banking industry and would have will find now the banking industry uh, having difficulty of regaining this public trust and therefore to protect the banking industry because it is very important in our national economy because this basically allows the, the quick distribution of financing to those businesses that need it rather than uh, go go to public and offer your equity and in an initial public offering, you have another option, which is to go to banks and financial institutions to borrow the needed financing. It, it basically stimulates the economy and, and the, the state recognizes this important role of banks. But at the same time, the state also as the parents patrie, which is the, the parent of, of the citizenry, it is also the responsibility of the state to protect the public. And because of this, of this dual responsibility by the state, the con Congress then um, enacted this new law, which is the General Banking Law of the Philippines, that will serve now as a framework, uh, as a general framework of how banks will be regulated in this country. In furtherance thereof, the state also plans or, or, or th thought that by passing this law, it shall promote and maintain a stable and efficient banking and financial system that is globally competitive dynamic and responsive to the demands of a, of a developing economy. Sometimes, class, if you'll notice, advanced economies in the world do have advanced banking system. And some countries in the world do rely on their banks and the financial sector, the financial industry, 
as their sole source of income and source source of of money of their of their entire economy the countries like switzerland Liechtenstein in europe Liechtenstein specifically which is a tiny principality relies solely on its 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 its, its massive banking industry because its legislators its lawmakers had the fourth foresight to reform their banking laws to provide stability efficiency and effectiveness that is what is the requirement of many multinational and international banks and financial institutions and and these countries like for example Liechtenstein, they may not have um industries that to rely on other than banks but their country is, is an advanced economy they have enough money to support its citizenry it's because they have an excellent banking law and of course an excellent um, implementation of these banking laws which is attractive for multinational and international banks right now let's proceed to the definition and classification of banks note uh, that under the general banking law a bank is defined as an entity engaged in the lending of funds obtained from the public in the form of deposits under this definition we can infer that for in order for an institution to be classified as a bank the three elements must be present what are these three elements first the entity must be engaged in the lending of funds meaning in order for an entity to be considered as a bank that entity must be lending money to the borrowers and where these institutions or this entity would get the funds to be lent to the borrowers obviously the fund now that is being lent to the borrowers by these entities are obtained from the public and this public that we contemplate class must be at least 20 depositors meaning less than 20 will disqualify or will remove that entity from the ambit or from the definition of bank of a bank and third obviously would be that the funds are in the form of deposits meaning that the fund being lent to the public must come from the deposits right if an entity would borrow um say for example an entity would borrow 100 million from another institution and lend this money to the public that entity is not a bank because the fund being lent to the borrower is not from deposits but rather from a borrowing so in short class we can surmise that in order for a bank or for an entity to classify or to qualify as a bank these three elements must be present right these three elements must be present that the entity is engaged in the lending of funds um funds obtained from the public with at least 20 depositors and funds are in the form of deposits note that a transaction involving a loan but purchase of um, but purchase of receivables at a discount within the purview of investing reinvesting or trading in securities which an investment company may perform is not banking precisely because the fund now is obtained by a loan not from a form of deposits right so um you have to check now class the elements all of these three elements must be present in order for an entity to be to qualify as a bank under the purview of the general banking law now what is the extent of ownership of foreign individuals and non-bank corporations in a bank so for foreign individuals and non-bank corporations class they can own or control up to 40 percent of the voting stock of the domestic bank under section 2 of the general banking law however republic act 72 77 21 or the foreign bank liberalization law allows now the entry of foreign banks in the philippines and the recent amendment of this law via republic act 1064 1 now allows for foreign banks to own or to buy as much as a hundred percent of a local bank and that means now foreign banks foreign banks huh, can own up to 100 percent of, of an equity of a domestic bank in the philippines following the enactment of this law sumitomo japan which is a banking institution in japan acquired 100 percent stake in security bank which made now security bank competitive with respect to um, the, the big three, the traditional big three, which are BDO, uh, Metro Bank, and the Bank of the Philippine Islands.
Now, general rule class, a corporation may own only 40% of a bank. Corporation, respective of what is the nature or what is the industry of that corporation, it may own only up to 40% of the bank. The exemptions would be if you are a universal bank like BDO, Unibank, Metro Bank, or BPI, you can own up to 100% of a thrift bank. And that's why you have BPI Family Savings Bank, you have um, other incarnation or other form of, of these universal banks. It's because these are separate entities. They are a different classification. They are not the universal bank, but they can be part of that group, like say BPI, for example. It's because BPI can own up to 100% of a thrift bank. Another exemption would be if you are a publicly traded corporation, meaning you are listed and publicly traded in the Philippine Stock Exchange, you can own up to 60% of a domestic bank in the Philippines. If you are a corporation who is in existence for 10 years, you can also own up to 60% of the bank. But note that this privilege, which is to acquire 60% of the bank, can only be exercised once. You can no longer acquire another bank which is more than, oh, up to 60 percent if you have already acquired 60 percent stake of another bank and that is perfectly the limitation you can only exercise this privilege of owning up to 60 percent once and of course as previously discussed ex exception to this limitation of 40 percent would be the foreign bank liberalization law or ra 7721 which was amended that allows now for foreign banks to own up to 100 percent security equity um in a bank in the philippines all right now let's proceed to the definition and classification of banks now the first um type of bank would be a universal bank this is primarily governed by this law general banking law and apart from operating as a bank, universal banks can also act or operate as an investment house, and they can also invest in non-allied enterprises, and they also have the highest capitalization. If we say allied enterprises class, these are industries or enterprises that are related or complementary to the banking industry. Universal banks are allowed to invest even if these industries or their investments are not directly related or complementary to the banking industry. And we call these enterprises non-allied enterprises. And at the same time, being um, capable of serving as an investment house and being able to um, invest in non-allied enterprises, naturally universal banks are um, have the highest capitalization, right? Another classification or another type of bank would be the commercial banks. These are ordinary banks governed by the, still by the same law, the general banking law. They have lo lower capitalization requirement compared to universal banks. And they, they cannot serve as an investment bank and they cannot invest in non-allied enterprises. Then the third type would be the thrift banks. Um, there are different incarnations or forms of thrift banks. One would be the savings and mortgage banks. These are banks primarily um, uh, primarily geared towards um, towards depositors who wanted to um, save money and at the same time to uh, offer loans for for mortgage, like say real estate mortgage or house mortgage. Um, say because um, you buy a house, it's quite costly, so you can't buy it in cash, so you need bank financing for this type of purchase, like say you, you bought land or, or house, the balance of which you'll subject to bank financing and then there will be monthly mortgage. Thrift banks um, are primarily engaged with this one. Another form would be stock savings and loan associations and private development banks, which are primarily governed by the Thrift Banks Act or Republic Act 7906. The fourth type, uh, the fourth classification of a bank would be rural banks. Rural banks are created by virtue of a mandate by the state, and at the same time by by an effort of our of of, of uh, government to make credit readily available and accessible to businessmen in rural areas in the countryside. That's why it's called rural banks. And primarily, these loans granted to businesses in the countryside must be in reasonable terms. And rural banks are primarily governed by the Rural Banks Act of 1992. 
Similar to thrift banks, rural banks can also be wholly owned by universal banks, the same way what would happen with formerly One Network Bank or ONB, which is now known as the BDO Rural Bank after the share swapped made by the owners of the One Network Bank with BDO. Right? It's not a direct sale, but rather a share swap or, or an acquisition of the shareholders, and then there is reorganization later on, later on by BDO after acquiring the shares from the shareholders of, of One Network Bank. Now, we also have cooperative banks. These are banks whose majority shares are owned and controlled by cooperatives. And these cooperatives you know, created this cooperative bank primarily to provide financial and credit services to the cooperative itself. It shall include cooperative rural banks, and they are primarily governed by the Cooperative Code or Republic Act 6938. We also have... Um, we also have Islamic banks. These are banks whose business dealings and activities are subject to the basic principles and rulings of the Islamic Sharia, as such as the Al Amana Islamic Investment Bank of the Philippines, which was created by Republic Act 6848. Remember that Islamic banks are different from regular banks because they are basically subject to rigid requirements under Islam. So Islamic banks uh, do not operate in the same manner as regular banks, right? Um, and of course, other classification of banks that may later on be determined or um, be prescribed by the Monetary Board of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, right? Now, let's proceed to the um, distinction so that we be able to understand clearly or be able to, to distinguish now universal banks from commercial banks from thrift banks. Obviously, both universal banks and commercial banks, as mentioned a while ago, are both governed by the general banking law, while the thrift, while thrift banks are governed by the Thrift Banks Act or RA 7906. Now, as mentioned as well, universal banks is the authority to exercise the powers of a commercial bank, meaning it can serve as a commercial bank, but at the same time as an investment house. When you say investment house class, it is a corporation that sells and guarantees the sale of securities and shares of stocks, like an example will be when Petron will tap an investment house in order to sell its stocks to the public or to those interested to invest in, in Petron. So that's an investment house. You basically sell it to the public or to those interested, and the investment house guarantees guarantees the corporation now the sale of the securities and shares of stocks. So, so basically, the investment house is guaranteeing the corporation selling its equity or its, uh, its shares uh, that it will be sold. Now, the third will be to engage in non-allied undertaking, which is, when you say non-allied, as mentioned a while ago, is not related at all to banking. Say, for example, if the entity will engage investments in real estate or realty, for example, in rental, they, they construct buildings to be rented out. So that's a non-allied enterprise or non-allied uh, venture which the universal banks are allowed to, to be engaged. While commercial banks, on the other hand, are simply limited to commercial banking. They engage in allied undertakings in addition to its general powers incidental to a corporation that they may exercise as may be necessary to carry on the business of a commercial banking. If you, again, if you'll say allied undertakings, these are activities or entities that are directly related, that enhance or complement the banking industry or the banking operation. Thrift banks, on the other hand, um, um, they exercise now the powers of a commercial bank, except, of course, to issue imported letters of credit, to accept or open checking account, except with prior approval by the monetary board, which requires at least a net asset worth of $28 million, right? So basically, a thrift bank class is like a commercial bank. Albeit, there are certain limitations. One limitation is the non-issuance of letters of credit. A, a thrift bank cannot issue a letter of credit. Second, you cannot open a checking account with a thrift bank, right? But, of course, some thrift banks may be able 
to um, allow or to offer checking accounts to its clients or depositors if they are approved and allowed by the Monetary Board of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas after compliance of a net asset worth 28 million, 28 million pesos. Right? Now, for the capitalization requirement for Universal Bank, which would comprise only of a head office, at least 3 billion. If there are already 10 branches, it will be 6 billion. And more than 10 to 100, it's 15 billion. And more than 100 branches, it's 20 billion. This is according to uh, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas Circular number 854, issued October 9, 2014. Note that the, the increase of branches of these universal banks will also entail an increase in capitalization. So if you notice, the more branches um, that, that the universal banks will open, the bigger the capitalization that it has to comply. Apart from its original capitalization, the universal banks will have to increase. All right? For commercial banks, that if only head office, $2 billion. If it's up to 10 branches, $4 billion. For more than 10, up to 100, it's 10 billion. And for more than 100 branches, it's 15 billion. For thrift banks, on the other hand, if it's within national capital region, if it's a head office only, it's 500 million. If up to 10 branches, 750 million. For more than 10 to 50 branches, it's 1 billion. And for more than 50 branches, 2 billion. Now, if the thrift bank's um, said office is located outside of the national capital region, it's lower, a, a little bit. Head office only, it's 200 million. If up, up to 10 branches, you have 300 million. For more than 10 to 50 branches, it's 400 million. And for more than 50 branches, you have 800 million. Now, for equity investment, universal banks are allowed to be a stockholder in both allied and non-allied undertaking while both commercial banks and thrift banks are limited only to allied undertaking. For non-allied transaction, universal banks are allowed to um, enter into, remember, non-allied undertaking. But note that universal banks are only limited to an investment of 25% of a, in a corporation, which is a non-allied enterprise. While universal banks are allowed to invest in non-allied enterprises or undertaking, there is a 25% limitation on the equity of that particular non-allied corporation or non-allied enterprise. While both commercial and thrift banks are not allowed, they cannot invest altogether. Now, for the total amount of investment equity, remember that universal banks can, um, uh, can invest in equity in other corporations, but not to exceed 50% of the bank's net worth, meaning... If the, if the net worth of the bank is 10 billion, for example, of Universal Bank, only 5 billion can be invested in other corporations or can be invested in, in other entities. Right? That's a limitation. Up to 5 billion lang, kasi 50% limitation. For commercial banks and thrift banks, they can invest in equity, like in other corporations, albeit it has to be an, an allied undertaking or an allied enterprise. And this allied enterprise investment is only up to 35% of the bank's net worth, right? And while there is a limitation class of 50% and 35% for universal banks, commercial banks, and thrift banks, based on the bank's net worth, note that a single equity investment cannot also be more than 25%, meaning if you invest in a corporation, while your investment in the corporation does not exceed yet the, the 50% threshold for Universal Bank, for example, cannot exceed the 50% threshold of your, of your bank's net worth, you cannot invest half of that 50% threshold in a single corporation because there is also a single investment limitation of 25% of the bank's net worth. This particular regulation class was really intended to avoid now or to prevent banks to make investments and to put their eggs on a single basket, meaning to put the bank on a massive exposure. Imagine if the, the bank will put 
a massive investment in a corporation that is that it finds to be high growth, high yield, high return, but it, but that corporation collapses or that corporation goes busted or went busted. So the bank is totally exposed and it may no longer be able to uh, make good of uh, the, the withdrawals of its depositors. So this particular requirement class limits now the banks from making a massive investment and a massive exposure with a single investment because the single investment um, limitation of not to exceed 25% of the bank's net worth. Now let's proceed to the distinction of banks from other forms. Now, um, if a quasi bank, these are entities engaged in the assignment with recourse or acceptance of depot subs or de deposit substitutes for purposes of relending or purchasing of receivables, borrowing of funds through the issuance, endorsement, and other obligations. And like banks, quasi banks do not accept deposits. Neither are funds obtained or insured by the PDIC or the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation. So they lend. Money. They there are a lending institution, but of course they get their funds from a, from deposit substitutes. Meaning these are not from deposits, and because these are not made from deposits, and therefore they act like banks, but they're not banks per se because they do not comply the three elements, which is the funds obtained must be from a deposit. So what is this deposit substitute? The, you go now to the bottom definition. Deposit substitutes is an alternative form of obtaining funds from the public through the issuance, endorsement, or acceptance of debt instruments for the borrower's own account for the purpose of relending or purchasing of receivables and other obligations. These instruments may include but not limited to bankers' acceptances, promissory notes, participations, certificates of assignments, and similar instruments with recourse and repurchase agreements. So you obtain funds, but not through a deposit. It could be a loan. It could be um, assurance of debt instruments. It could be um, an IOU. It could be a note payable. As long as you get these funds, and the funds now are being lent to the public or to the business, uh, to businessmen or other individuals. While you're lending, the source of your fund is not through deposits. They are deposit substitutes, and therefore does not make you a bank, rather a quasi-bank. Now we also have trust entities. These are uh, entities that are engaged in trust business. When you say trust business, you act as a trustee. Trustee is when you are uh, mandated by the trust agreement to um, 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 hold the property for the benefit or on behalf of the beneficiary. The trust store, which is the original owner of the property, wanted you to manage and preserve that particular property. But the purpose of the preservation and administration of the property was to the benefit of the beneficiary who is not yet capable of handling the property uh, because he's not yet um, in proper age or may not be considered as fit to administer or to govern his own estates or his own affairs. A common form of trust would be for, say, certain properties left of uh, for minor individuals, uh, say for example, upon timely death of the parents, there are properties left to the minor individuals. And obviously, being a minor, um, he cannot administer the property nor enter into agreements that are binding because you know for for your in, under your business law that an individual cannot give consent, and therefore, um, if a minor individual will administer his own properties, these transactions entered into will be unenforceable. Therefore, we need a trustee. And these trust entities um, um, do hold the property for the benefit of the beneficiary. Note that um, the amount of money received by the bank from the depositors are not being held under a trust agreement, but rather an, 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 um, a, a, an understanding that this amount of money received from the depositors are being relent, are being lent to, to other borrowers or being invested in, in enterprises that would yield more income with respect to the bank. And therefore, a bank does not act as a trustee of these funds. All right? Now, we also have financial intermediaries. Financial intermediaries, um, these are persons or entities whose principal functions include the lending, investing, or placement of funds on pieces of evidence of indebtedness or equity deposited with them, acquired by them, or otherwise coursed through them 
either for their own account or for the account of others. An example of a financial intermediary would be pawn shops. Okay, they lend, they invest, or place funds um, um, by virtue of uh, the evidence of indebtedness or equity deposited with them, meaning there is a security deposited with these institutions or these entities that lend money. Okay, but this lending does not arise from the funds of depositors and therefore that they are not banks. Okay. Now let's proceed to the corporate powers of a bank. All powers of um, co provided under the corporation code, under the revised corporation code, like the issuance of stocks and entering into mergers and consolidation with other corporations or banks, banks are allowed to do this because they are first primarily a corporation. And being a corporation, they are vested with regular corporate powers, aside from the fact that they operate as a bank with different Regula regulation or different requirements. Um, banks can also acquire real properties when it is needed for business or in settlement of debt incurred in the course of business. Property as may be mortgaged to it to secure a debt in good faith and property it may acquire during execution sale to satisfy judgments. But banks cannot acquire real property in settlement of a civil liability arising from crime. All right, that's another limitation. A universal bank and commercial bank can both invest in equity, but note that only a universal bank is allowed to invest in equity of non-allied enterprises. Now, for banking powers, on the other hand, before a corporation may be allowed to operate as a bank, that corporation must first obtain a certificate of authority to register. This is a requirement before a bank may register or amend the articles of incorporation with the Securities and Exchange Commission. This certificate of authority to register is issued by the Monetary Board of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Now, to, um, to satisfy the Monetary Board upon its application of the certificate of authority to register, a bank must um, prove the following. First is all requirements of existing laws and regulations to engage in the business for which the applicant is proposed to be incorporated have been complied with. Second is that the public interest and economic conditions, both general and local, justify the authorization, meaning the national economy or the local economy where the bank uh, plans to operate um, allows for the entry of a new banking entity. And of course, the amount of capital, the financing organization, direction and administration, as well as the integrity and responsibility of the organizers and administrators, reasonably assure that the safety of deposits and the public interest. Kaya mano discuss na hindi basta bastang you can open a bank because you're not only um you know trying to comply with a massive capitalization requirement, but at the same time the people behind organizing the new banking entity applied before the monetary board of the Banco Central must be of good reputation as well, that they can convince, convince the monetary board that the new bank will be in the safe hands and these were not scrupulous individuals trying to uh, defraud the public, right? Now, what are the general powers and functions of the bank? When, when We've already discussed the general corporate powers, right? So when you're, you're already a bank, um, you are allowed to accept drafts and issue letters of credit. Bank drafts, letters of credit is a, a sort of security on the part of a supplier to be paid when a supplier delivers now the um, ordered items or inventory by the buyer or purchaser. So in order for uh, the buyer to receive the items or inventory delivered by the supplier, um, the the buyer must first secure a letter of credit, meaning a bank and the accepting bank must be able to um, will issue a letter of credit showing now to the supplier that they are willing to to pay the, the supplier based on the um, communication of the buyer bank. Meaning the buyer contacts his bank saying that I need a letter of credit to show my supplier that he will get he will be paid. So the, the bank of the buyer will contact a bank where the supplier is located and the, the two banks will communicate 
and the accepting bank, which is the bank where the supplier is located, will now issue a letter of credit showing now to the supplier that we will pay you because the bank of the buyer promises us or guarantees us that we will receive the payment from the uh, the, the buyer's bank upon delivery. So meaning may ginapang hawakan ngayon si supplier na security that he will be paid. So if there will be a problem later on, the supplier is out of it because the supplier will have to be paid by the accepting bank. The accepting bank now will have to communicate with the bank of the customer. That's the, that's how letters of credit works class. And this is usually um, being used when supplier is located in another country, the buyer is in another country. Because you don't expect naman na mag-wire transfer immediately, di ba? Na walang security that the items will be delivered. So the the accepting bank now will only pay the um, supplier upon forwarding to the accepting bank now of the proof of delivery. Diba? So secured ang parties, walang perang lumabas unless my delivery. And the um, supplier is secured na upon delivery, my proof na delivery, is he will be paid and he can get it from the accepting bank. We also, uh, banks are also allowed to discount and negotiate promissory notes, drafts, bills of exchange, and other instrument, evidencing debt, accepting or creating demand deposits, receiving other types of deposit and deposit substitutes or depot subs, buying and selling forex and gold or silver bullion, acquire marketable bonds and other debt securities, to extend credit and the determination of bonds and other debt securities eligible for investment, including maturities and aggregate amount of such investment, subject to rules issued by the MB or the Monetary Board, and all other powers that may be necessary to carry on the business of the bank. So this is the catch-all provision, meaning if wala na mention, but these are necessary to carry out the banking operations, and these are implied powers, banking powers of of that particular entity. Now, when a bank now uh, has to issue stocks, okay, um, the monetary board prescribes the rules and regulations on the types of stock that a bank may issue. Note that under the general banking law, section 9, banks shall issue only par value stocks, meaning banks are not allowed to issue no par value stocks. The general rule is that no bank shall purchase or acquire shares of its own capital stock or to accept its own shares as security for a loan. So basically, the banks, in ge by general rule, are not allowed to have treasury shares, which is the acquisition of its own capital stock, or to accept loans, the guarantee of which or security is its own shares of stocks, meaning this borrower owns a shares, shares of stocks of the bank. The bank lent money to the borrower. And the borrower uses the bank's own shares as security that's not allowed. Except, of course, if that is authorized by the monetary board by certain exemptions and by certain ano, up, um, review. Okay? So if MB, if the MB approves this, then you can. Now, in every case, the stock, so purchase or acquired, shall within six months from the time of its purchase or acquisition be sold or disposed at a public or a private sale. Note that foreign individuals and non-bank corporations may own control up to 40%. Note, it can, can be up 100% now for foreign banks. Of the voting stock of a domestic bank, this rule shall apply to Filipinos and domestic non-bank corporations. But note that foreign individuals and non-bank corporations can own up to 40%. This rule apply to Filipinos and domestic non-bank corporations. Note that the percentage of foreign-owned voting stocks in a bank shall be determined by the shall determine uh, by, by the citizenship of the individual stockholders in that bank. The citizenship of the corporation, which is a stockholder in the bank, shall follow the citizenship of the controlling stockholders of that corporation, irrespective of the place of incorporation. So what we're trying to say here, class, is that if this corporation is incorporated in the United States. But majority, say 60% of its stockholders are Filipino, respective of the fact that that corporation is incorporated in the U.S., that corporation is a Filipino corporation because the shareholders are, majority of which are Filipinos. Stockholdings of individuals relating to each other within the fourth degree 
of consanguinity or affinity, legitimate or common law, shall be considered family groups or related interest and must be fully disclosed in all transactions by such corporations or related groups of persons with the bank. Two or more corporations owned or controlled by the same family group or same group of persons, we call them uh, corporate stock holdings, shall be considered related interest and must be fully disclosed in all transactions by such corporations or related group of persons with the bank. Now, included in the banking powers as well is when the instances when a bank is prohibited from declaring dividends if the clearing account with the BSP is overdrawn. Kasi di ba may clearing accounts kasi ang mga banks with the BSP. If that's overdrawn, the, the bank is not allowed to issue dividends. Second, if it is deficient in the required liquidity floor, meaning the minimum liquidity requirement by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas or the Monetary Board, for five or more consecutive days, the bank is not allowed to issue dividends. Might as well maintain your liquidity floor, or minimum li uh, liquidity. Bakit ka mag-issue ng dividends, di ba? If you are not able to maintain your liquidity. Third, if the bank does not comply with the liquidity standards as well as the prescribed ratios by the Banco Central for purposes of determining funds available for dividend declaration. And fourth, if it has committed a major violation as may be determined by the Banco Central. So a major violation will, will result now to a penalty which is not to be allowed to issue dividends in the meantime or for the period. There is also a requirement for banks to maintain independent directors. These are persons who will sit in the board of directors that are not affiliated or not an employee or not related to the stockholders of the bank, its subsidiaries or affiliates or related interest. Meaning these are individuals devoid of any relationship with the bank. And sometimes for banks to obtain independent directors, they usually get retired justices of the Supreme Court because these are supposed to be men of, of, integ uh, of, of integrity. And they are not related to, say, the parties or the major stockholders or not an employee or did not work with the company whatsoever. Then they are deemed to be independent directors. Note that irrespective of the number of directors, um, members of the board of directors, uh, the banks should have two independent directors. So that's the minimum requirement, two independent directors, right? Now for banks class, when they enter into transactions or they, uh, when banks um, engage in transactions or do business, the bank is required to exercise extraordinary diligence in its dealings with depositors. It is primarily because of the bank, the banking industry is imbued with public interest and therefore it is incumbent upon the bank not only to exercise ordinary diligence but rather extraordinary dil diligence. Consequently, the diligence required of banks is more than that of a Roman pater familias or a good father of a family. It has to be more than that. Because obviously, public interest is at stake here. This was prescribed by the Supreme Court in its 2011 ruling in the case of PCI Bank versus Balsameda. Okay? Extraordinary diligence. Well, not PCI Bank ngayon, but this was uh, ruled in 2011. But this case must go back to when PCI is still existing as an independent bank. Because remember, in early 2000, PCI uh, merged with Equitable Bank, known as Equitable PCI Bank. And then Equitable PCI, the bigger bank, was acquired by a smaller bank, which is Banco de Oro. Why is it that Banco de Oro uh, was able to acquire or was able to afford um, a bigger bank, which is Equitable PCI. Obviously, it's because Banco de Oro is part of the SM Group. So SM was able to generate funds to acquire uh, Equitable PCI. So the merger now of Equitable PCI and Banco de Oro resulted to the formation of one of the big three banks, now with biggest in asset base, which is BDO Unibank. All right? Now let's proceed to the nature of bank funds and bank deposits. The function of the bank is to receive a thing, primarily money, from the depositors with the obligation of safely keeping it and returning the same. Note, class, that when you return the same amount of the money, this is to return 
the same amount of money. Okay? Not the same, the exact bills that were deposited. Because basically, class, deposit is a contract of loan or a contract of mutuum. Because we have the two types of contracts. Remember, contracts of loan class. We have komodatum and mutuum. If you say komodatum, you actually loan the person, but you expect that that person will return the exact item that you gave, you parted ways or you give. Say, for example, I loaned you this ring uh, or I loaned you this watch, but you have to return to me the exact watch, the exact brand, the exact watch that I that I lent you, the exact serial number. That's komodatum because you basically have to return the exact item. But when you say uh, loan of mutuum class, you basically ha just have to return to me the exact amount and quality irrespective of the fact kung ano yung isa uli mo sa akin. And that's basically loan because you, you return to me the exact amount of money that I gave you but not exactly the actual bills with a serial number. Kahit anong pera pala ibalik mo sa akin, as long as same amount, okay lang. And that's the contract of mutuum. And that is the nature of bank deposits a contract of loan. Okay? So there are the kinds of deposits between a bank and its depositors. Uh, we have a debtor-creditor relationship, and that's the regular loan. And then we have also the special kinds of deposits. We have demand deposits, all those liabilities of banks, which are denominated in Philippine currency and are subject to payment and legal tender upon demand by representation of checks. And we have savings deposit, which is the common type of deposit and usually evidenced by a passbook. Okay? Now, note class that for the savings deposit, the requirement of presentation of passbooks is mandated by the Manual of Regulations for Banks. A bank is negligent if it will allow now the withdrawal without requiring the presentation of the passbook. This is enunciated by the Supreme Court in the case of BPI versus Court of Appeals. <coughs> we also have ne negotiable order of withdrawal account. <coughs> These are interest-bearing deposit accounts that combine the payable on-demand feature of checks and investment feature of savings accounts. <coughs> we also have time deposits. These are account with fixed term the payment of which cannot be legally required within such a specified number of days. And then we have the trustee trustor, where yes, a savings account established under a trust agreement containing funds that will be administered by the bank for the benefit of the trustor or another beneficiary. Say a fund there, say multi-million fund um, maintained by the bank and administered by the bank in, in favor of a beneficiary, which is the child of the trustor, for example, and is only required to um, provide the beneficiary a certain amount, fixed amount monthly, so that that beneficiary will not squander the savings account or the trust fund. So the bank serves now as a trustee, okay? And of course, as agent principal, when deposit of checks for a collection, deposit for a specific purpose, and deposit for safekeeping. Now, we will continue with our lecture on nature of bank funds and bank deposits in our second video, all right?